I'd like to welcome everyone to today's second Net Zero Live webinar. What are the implications of the future buildings and home standards for the industry? For the first time in eight years, the government is proposing big changes to energy standards for buildings. Earlier this year, the government published draft energy regulations for new homes, which builds on the proposed future home standard published in 2019. This proposed an interim standard that takes effect next year before leading on to the full standard, which will take effect in 2025. This um, tougher standard in 2025 will include a ban on gas fired and oil fired boilers and um, also will try and will, seeks to reduce carbon emissions in new homes by 70 to 80 percent. Earlier this year, the government also published the future building standard that's in building carbon reductions for non domestic buildings with the idea that this interim non buildings standard will take effect at a similar time to the future homes interim standard. Like the future home standard, tougher standards for non domestic buildings will be introduced at a later date, although the consultation on this topic does not say what those are. So anyway, today we're going to discuss the implications of the, these standards for the industry and how these relate to the net zero agenda. So I'm joined, I'm joined by three speakers, um, Lynn Sullivan, um, who's an architect and is on multiple boards, including the Good Homes Alliance and the Green Construction Board. Alan Fogarty, who is the sustainability partner at consultant Candle. And David Bones, who is a head of UK Net Zero Design Consulting at JLL. So the format of today's session is each speaker will talk for roughly eight minutes. Um, and then once all the formal presentations are over, we'll discuss the issues raised and also take questions from you, our audience. So I would encourage you to submit questions. You can do this during the presentations or um, obviously afterwards as well. And then we'll sort of look at those and put those to our panel. Um, so, um, Lynn is going to talk first, she's going to talk about the future, focus mostly on the future home standard, I believe, and also some of its shortcomings in terms of meeting our net zero target. So, Lynn, if you would um, um, like to start your presentation, thanks very much. Okay. Can you see that, okay? Yes. Great. Uh, morning, everyone, and thank you for asking me to join this session. Uh, I'm yes, my my whole life are, revolves around the net zero agenda at the moment. Um, way to go, I guess. Um, I'd like to take us back a bit, really, uh, to its origins, um, and I'm going to speak from the perspective of, as Thomas mentioned, uh, a member of the UK's Green Construction Board which is the sustainability arm of the Construction Leadership Council, but also as chair of Good Homes Alliance. Uh, and we uh, represent a sort of cross industry uh, membership, really including 30 uh, local authorities and registered providers who have declared climate emergency and kind of want to adopt these standards for their potential output of, I think it's 100,000 homes over the next 10 year period. So. Uh, this is a very, very important agenda for, for them, not least. Oops. Have, has it moved on? Um, not yet, no. No, you've still, still got the introductory slide. Sorry, Thomas, it's misbehaving. We did run, uh, we did try this earlier. Right. Uh, Ruth, you're going to have to um, help me here. Uh, I can carry on talking if you like. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I guess you just, uh, is this a PowerPoint, is it? I mean, you just, would it yeah, not this is a PowerPoint presentation. Right. So um, it should, should get moved on okay. Yeah. If you just come okay. out of full screen mode. Okay. Sorry about this. Well,
Well, I think I'm not going to get there, am I, at the moment? <laughs> Escape. Ah, oh, here we go. Um, let me try again. That? That is it. Yeah, we've moved on. Bingo. Great. So sorry about that. Um, it, it, always a refresh is what's needed. We probably all need a bit of that. Um, yeah, so 2019, you know, where did the future home standard originate? 2019, um, the Climate Change Committee did, uh, actually produced two reports on housing, one of which uh, flagged this uh, need for new homes by 2025 at the latest to have uh, ultra high, what they called ultra high levels of energy efficiency and use decarbonized uh, heating systems. And following shortly on that, uh, the then Chancellor Philip Hammond announced uh, the very same by 2025, low carbon heating world levels, world leading levels of energy efficiency. Uh, by the end of 2019, things had somewhat changed because uh, the MHCLG consultation referenced homes which will have at least 75% lower than those built to current reg standards. And we have to remember that the last review of uh, building regulations part L for homes was, well, actually I chaired the review for BRAC, so it was actually 2012. So, you know, it's out of date. Uh, we didn't go as far then as we hoped we might. And of course, since then the zero carbon homes was canceled. So we, you know, sort of benchmarking to then is a very long time ago in terms of our now very ambitious agenda. And we've just recently had the response to this consultation, uh, which again sort of introduces another classification, which is no further energy retrofit work will be necessary to enable them to become zero carbon. But in fact, as we all know, we could build to 2006 standards. Uh, and if we have enough sort of wind power energy, renewable energy, we could carry on as usual. But uh, what we're appreciating is that as we decarbonize industry, vehicles, uh, you know, all transport, you know, there's a heck of a lot, going to be a heck of a lot of demand on our uh, decarbonized grid. So the fact of the matter is that we know how, how to reduce demand in buildings. And, and that that's what this future home standard should represent. So the most recent last week, I think, announcement uh, Boris, uh, new target 78% by 2035. I'm told that's the equivalent of the sixth carbon budget, which the Climate Change Committee delivered before Christmas. <clears throat> and uh, part of the response uh, to the Part L consultation on future homes standard, and that includes the interim standard that Thomas talked about, uh, but looked ahead to the 2025 standard, 72% of responses said that that objective of 75 to 80% less emissions over current requirements was not ambitious enough. Um, and again, going back to uh, the Climate Change Committee's view, which matches this 78% target, uh, again, they reiterate ultra high standards of energy efficiency and they suggest uh, measures like triple glazing and, and high levels of air tightness. So I'd suggest there's already creeping in uh, quite a, a, um, a credibility gap, if you like. Um, and you also, uh, a Climate Change Committee, have flagged the key issue that any standards we set should have uh, robust enforcement and that we should move towards understanding actual performance of buildings in use. Otherwise, we're just languishing in the realms of theory. So, uh, the work I carried out also in 2019, well, 2018, 2019, so concurrent with the Chancellor's announcement, uh, was to respond to an earlier call from government to halve all building energy use by 2030, known as the building's uh, the clean growth uh, mission, the building's mission target. Um, and we, what we did uh, in that task group, which I chaired, um, was, was really analysed where the energy in buildings was, what we could do about that key issue of reducing demand. And we made many recommendations about uh, an approach to, to delivering on that. And we also used uh, uh, multiple examples of where it had been delivered already. And some of those examples have dated back to uh, 2015. So it's perfectly possible to have 
energy demand was the conclusion we reached. And there were several com uh, components to that because the mission called for all energy use to be halved. So it wasn't just about halving uh, emissions um, on the basis of our current notion or building about regulated energy. It was all uh, initial, all building energy use. And in that report, I, I included this little diagram, which is it, it actually came from the original Energy Sprong paper from 2015, which disaggregates all energy use in homes. Space heating, hot water, lighting pumps and fans, and electric, because actually the so-called unregulated bit, I mean, if your home isn't doesn't work well, you need to plug in cooling or plug in heating or or uh, plug in fans, you know, if, if you're overheating, something like that, then, then actually those plug loads are significant in terms of your, your uh, um, footprint, but they're also significant in terms of regulating for the future. So the 72% that uh, said that the 75% reduction was not sufficient, uh, why was that? So I've referenced some of these already that the world, the world leading energy efficiency, it's not quite there on passive house. It talks about the baseline of uh, leakage as, it, as it's currently proposed for building regulation, the threshold rather than, a, rather than an aspirational standard. No move to in-use performance. Uh, we advocated to be measured in kilowatt hours per square meter precisely so that uh, occupants can, can compare the design performance with real life performance. Uh, and the last thing I did with Zero Carbon Hub was precisely about the performance gap back in 2015. Uh, on average, at least 60% more energy for heating was being used than predicted. So clearly the performance gap is, is still an important thing to address. And now that we are going down on operational energy, we really need to bring in embodied carbon measurement as a key component, although that wasn't part of the building commission stuff. So um, energy use intensity, total energy used at the meter. The left-hand side is our building's mission report. We took a baseline of now. How are these types of buildings performing now? So we use domestic, commercial, and schools. And for homes, it was round about 140 kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, and then we found at least 10 examples, which are illustrated as case studies, of homes which uh, had been designed because clients wanted them to do what they said on the tin uh, to uh, at least half of that, so 70 kilowatts per square meter. And that was the thing we were demonstrating. It can be done now. Uh, and hey presto, uh, with a little bit of help from me and, uh, and others, the RIBA adopted that target for 2025. Total energy use intensity for domestic buildings, 70 kilowatts per square meter. And those of you that are familiar with the London Energy Transformation Initiative work, LETI, uh, they have gone a step further looking ahead to net zero and saying we can reduce that demand even further if we adopt properly world leading energy efficiency, etc. So, so, you know, that's where a lot of us are thinking we need to go if we're really backcasting from the end game, which is net zero. And this was one of the earliest things I did on the building mission, which is actually identify current uh, building loads. So that's domestic, you know, attack those loads that you can in order to reduce demand. So in this case, space heating demand, we reduced by uh, something like 75 or 80%. Uh, and then use low carbon efficient uh, systems for heating and hot water. And then, you know, you've reduced your load sufficiently that you're that your take on the decarbonized grid eventually is, is much less. And the same is true for non-domestic buildings. Whoops, I think one of my little piles of energy is gone, but anyway, never mind. So the same principle applies to non-domestic buildings. So we were, just to reiterate, we're talking about all energy use, not models. We're talking about uh, a range of building types, not just future homes. We're talking about um, referencing standards which already do this and examples which already do this uh, and uh, we're all, we also did a similar exercise on embodied energy and that's how you really get to net zero so the question is do we really want to get net to net zero and is the future home standard going far enough 
So we suggest uh, that more that needs to be done. And I just love this in because the energy use intensity was also, we, we showed for commercial buildings quite doable at, you know, today and has been done. It's the same objective that uh, UK Green Building Council have set up, commercial buildings, measure energy use intensity, the neighbours system and the Better Buildings Partnership, which I'm sure my colleagues will reference, <coughs> have also adopted these same uh, metrics. So energy use intensity, halving actually, as it turns out, by uh, somewhere between 2025 and 2030. Um, so, so these flag up some key things that need to happen that are not necessarily at the moment foreshadowed by the future homes or building standards as we've seen them described. <clears throat> Start regulating total energy consumption in order to compare with energy used at the meter and think about total energy use. So the national compliance methodology for regulation must evolve. Uh, we can set actual energy performance targets for homes in quite kilowatt hours per meter and move away from this notion, notion of building, which we know is flawed, uh, reflected in EPCs that, that really are not fit for purpose. Uh, set energy targets to ensure both demand and consumption are reduced. So, so that's really about tackling energy demand. Uh, and then we'll have a, a chance of actually meeting it with decarbonised electricity. Um, and to close the performance gap. So that means moving towards verification in use uh, and attending to quality in delivery. And that's the biggest incentive uh, to actually check that it does what it says on the tin. And last but not least, don't forget embodied energy because that's about whole life carbon and we need to go there as well in our homes. So thank you very much. Great, well, thanks very much indeed, Lynn, for your presentation. Um, I just got one quick question before we move on. Um, I mean, you mentioned Passive House a couple of times during your presentation as a bit of an exemplar. And it, Passive House has the benefit of being tried and tested. Um, it's been proven to work in use, and it also has that all important total energy use target. Wouldn't it just be simpler just to use that for new homes? <laughs> well, indeed, talking about our local authority membership in Good Homes Lives, I mean, many of them are setting that as their benchmark, now that they're still allowed to set their own targets. Right, so, so it's certainly an option. I mean, Climate Change Committee have said in the region of Passive House, but I think there or thereabouts, because all those examples we showed in our building mission report are there or thereabouts on Passive House. They attend to quality uh, in construction, they attend to coal bridging, they, you know, they maximise new values it's pretty much the, the same checklist, if you like, as Passive House. So yeah, it's a very good example. It's been going for 30 years. Absolutely. Great. Well, thanks very much indeed. So we're now going to move on to um, Alan Fogarty, who's going to um, talk about both um, standards, um, with also with a bit of a focus on building performance. So Alan, over to you. So yes, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk on um, building regulations primarily, um, but net zero carbon has been mentioned and what I would say about it is that it's very difficult to get. There's no silver bullet, it's about incremental improvement and you can see the problem, say you can't solve the problem unless you can see it. And this is a chart showing EPCs versus actual energy consumption and the grey bars are the actual energy consumption and you can see there's almost no correlation between the EPC and uh, energy in use. And if you can't see a problem, you can't solve a property. So building regulations, the kind of calculations that are used in it are not the ones to use if you're looking at net zero carbon. It's for about compliance with a, a, a minimum standard. Um, Neighbours has been mentioned and there's a Neighbours UK available now um, and design for performance is the kind of predictive uh, element of that and that's really important and uh, an equivalent to that is uh, Passive House again mentioned and Passive House is a standard that genuinely delivers. This is um, a study that we did for Welsh Government when we were reviewing the standards for their schools and it shows a whole range of schools but in the the green box at the bottom, they are all to a passive house standard and you can see that they are consistently delivering low levels of energy consumption. 
Um, what I would say is that passive house is a good starting position, but there's a whole trade-off between performance of systems and performance of envelopes. And there's effectively a sweet spot depending on what type of building you're talking about. So just looking at dwellings in terms of building regulations, we're talking about a 30% reduction or thereabouts uh, in the 2022 standard. Um, but the look forward uh, in terms of 2025 is a 75 to 80%. Now we aren't talking about real energy, but we are talking about a much higher standard uh, in terms of uh, systems that would go into a building, envelopes, etc. And in many ways, it's a, a game changer. And also it's saying no gas boilers, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and um, the, the, there's criticism in the sense that there's no energy in use uh, in intensity targets, but the reality is that building regulations isn't designed to be able to deliver that type of calculations. You need to go back to the real energy uh, type calculations such as neighbors and passive house. Um, what's also been introduced is uh, overheating type arrangements for housing, which is absolutely essential because it's been failing quite badly as a res uh, result of too much glass and poor understanding of natural ventilation. Um, and they've introduced this very simple metric and then a proper uh, dynamic me uh, method to, for more complicated and uh, detailed types um, uh, calculations. And very importantly, making sure that noise, pollution, security are all considered. It wasn't unusual for a natural ventilation study to be carried out in a noisy environment with the windows open and then do a co acoustic study with the windows closed. So it just couldn't perform properly in use. In terms of non-domestic, um, the consultation is kind of suggesting 22 to 27% reduction in CO2 emissions compared to where we are now with a preference for the 27%. Um, the, the look forward is not saying what percentage reduction is likely, but it's likely to be very similar to the, the domestic side of things. So again, um, um, it'll be in the range of 70 to 80 percent. Um, sorry, I'll just, just get back to that. Sorry, I couldn't see my screen. Uh, my presentation seems to have disappeared. Just one second. Ah, okay, there we go. So the 2025 is talking about low carbon heating um, and they're talking about it being dependent on uh, building type. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that because I don't necessarily agree with that type of a, a approach. Um, so it's suggesting heat pumps for various building types according to the um, the the uh, heating use and the hot water generation. And in particular, it questions whether heat pumps are appropriate for for hospital type arrangements where there's large amounts of hot water needing to be generated. Um, and um, some of the criticisms for the future building standard is no energy use intensity, which I mentioned, uh, no performance in use. Well, building regulations can't deal with performance in use on the basis that uh, it signs off a whole range of different requirements for the buildings, including things like uh, fire, etc. And it has to be delivered at the point of handover of the building. So it can't then have requirements for, for after handover of the building itself. And the unregulated loads of buildings is very much dependent on the use of the building, how the users themselves are uh, using things, uh, intensity of uh, a small power, etc. So the only way you can actually control that type of thing is through green leases, which is how neighbours uh, deals with some of these things. But building regulations finds it very difficult to um, um, deal with that. So in terms of eliminating or minimising fossil fuels, um, I, I think that we shouldn't be looking at eliminating completely, we should be looking at minimizing. And the reason I say that is that there should be a transition type arrangement. So for existing buildings in particular, if you get rid of gas fired boilers, then you're you're trying to um, use a, a potentially an existing heating system <clears throat> to, to um, distribute the heat around the building and they aren't uh, appropriate for heat pumps. So it can become a very expensive exercise to um, replace the whole system in the building as well as the actual heat generator itself. So a hybrid approach would allow you to have a heat pump and just keep a gas boiler for peak times. Um, CHP, well, that at the moment is about 
uh, the equivalent of the the, the uh, electrical system, say the grid uh, carbon content. And as the grid carbon content drops, then the CHP is going to be far more intensive in terms of um, carbon emissions. Um, but we can potentially put in 20% hydrogen into the grid, so that would then change the uh, balance for a CHP. And then as a kind of transitional arrangement, you could have a CHP associated with a campus, for example, of a, a university or a hospital uh, for five, 10 years, where it's generating significant um, financial savings. And that financial saving could be used to upgrade the envelopes of buildings so that they are suitable for receiving a heat pump in 10 years time. And then you would replace the CHP at that point in time. Um, moving on or moving away from building regulations, Bayes have uh, just very recently started a consultation on their national performance based policy framework. And to my mind, this is a really important initiative. So what this is, is effectively modernizing the DEC. And similar to the DEC, it's going to be based on measured energy usage. So moving away from Part L, where it's using calculations that are not representative of actual performance, the uh, this standard would be based on the actual performance of buildings. So we finally would have visibility. Um, initially, it's been focused on offices above 1,000 meters squared, but in the long term, the intention is that it'll apply to all building types in each sector with um, targets tailored to the, um, the specific building type. Um, within the consultation, it interestingly identifies that EPC ratings do not translate into energy performance, and the chart I showed you at the start um, uh, was exactly what they referenced. But in the same sentence, they say that it still has a role. So um, I, I, I kind of wonder what exactly the EPC is going to be doing in the future. Um, what they are suggesting, of course, though, is that uh, the EPC ratings are going to be, have to be, or the, the, the minimum standards are going to have to change. And in terms of um, uh, what they expect, they're expecting buildings to achieve an EPC of B by uh, 2030 with an interim target of EPC C by 2028. So this is really going to be pushing buildings to achieve much higher standards going forward. But our experience is that the whole of the market is starting to move in that direction anyway. So it's a, it's a, it's a push and pull type arrangement. Thank you for listening. Great, well, th th thanks very much, Alan. Um, so before we move on to our final speaker, um, you mentioned the issue of hot water. Um, I mean, do you see um, in the future that because of the challenges of um, getting high temperatures, high hot water temperatures using heat pumps, that there's going to be a role for gas going forward into the long into the future? Um, not necessarily, no. I, I think it's, it's more existing buildings that have the difficulty because of the the way their systems are set up. So you've you've got small emitters, small pipework, uh, which are used to much higher temperatures to to be able to transmit the heat around the building, and heat pumps don't function particularly well at high temperatures. In terms of hot water generation, it's possible to use heat pumps. And I think there's a whole area which isn't addressed at all under the regulations in terms of how we recover heat from buildings. And I'm not talking about heat recovery from air systems. I think any water in a building, be it uh, flushed down uh, toilets or showers, etc., if, if, if it's been in the building for a while, it'll have got up to 21, 22 degrees. And then all this water is being pushed then down into the drains. And the point is that geothermal is based on a temperature of 12 or 14 degrees, and that provides a very efficient way of uh, um, providing heating and uh, sorry, heating the buildings with heat pumps. If you imagine all the water in the drains at 20 to 30 degrees, that's a huge resource available to us. And you can either put the, put the heat out of it or push the heat back into it. So we need to think in a much more uh, joined up way as to how we address the energy flows through buildings and make sure that we're actually recovering all the heat we have generated in the first instance and uh, before we start thinking about generating new quantities of heat. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our final speaker. Um, so David Burnis from um, JRL um, is going to really, I think he's, your, your point David is going to be really why both standards need to be more ambitious. So um, over to you. Sure, my screen. Thank you. Now then, I can't see my presentation, but hopefully you can. 
Yes, it's um, it's it's showing. Ah, okay then. Right. I wonder why I can't see it because I actually can't. Oh, just one moment. Ah, grand forum. Okay. <clears throat> We'll just uh, just need to start by having a quick refresh on net zero carbon. And as we know, we've got our ambition of net zero carbon by 2050, uh, and that's been picked up already um, by by Alan. Um, we've got this uh, operational performance uh, of 55 kilowatts for commercial and 35 for residential, and some embodied carbon targets. Uh, the embodied carbon targets coming from Letty has already been picked up. That embodied carbon isn't a component of uh, the 2021 uh, changes. But I just wanted to touch on that as a starting point because um, I had a look through both of the standards and I was intrigued to see that the future building standards made 15 references to cost effective. So I went to have a look to see what cost effective meant contextually um, and I didn't actually find anything but I did find um, some quite interesting information on the impact assessment and if we look at the impact assessments in the table there for future homes, um, this is on option two, and I think Alan picked up on the two options, but option two is the preferred option. Um, you can see there is a net benefit to the UK of approximately £600 uh, million. Pounds. And for future buildings, there's a net benefit of approximately uh, £200 million. Pounds. And interestingly, when I looked at option one in both cases, which was a lesser standard, um, the benefits were either non-existent or much smaller. So there seems to be an increase in benefit um, for, uh, for the UK. I'm qualifying that because clearly different parts of this supply chain may not see that benefit and may actually have a net cost. Um, but there seems to be a net benefit based on uh, maximizing our carbon savings. So it's infers to me that there is the ability that we can um, afford to do more. David, so, sorry to interrupt, but I think you're stuck on your introductory slides still. I, I'm oh, okay, I'll go back. Maybe I need to do the same as, as Lynn and come back in again. Let me just try. How is that? Are we on something that says cost effective changes? Um, we're still on your first slide. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear. I'll come out of it completely and try again then. Uh, um, you'll be able to see all of my various bits and bobs now. Right. Uh, no, I'm still, still, still um, on your introductory slide. Not quite sure what's happening. Can you see your slides on your own screen? I can. Yes. What What can you see on your screen? Um, I can see the my first slide uh, in not in presentation mode. I mean, that's what we can see. We, we can see the same. So whatever you can see on your screen is what we all see. Um, and as I say, we're still, it's still the first one. Okay. Um, so if you want to just stop sharing for a second and then share again. It might just mean that it needs to come out and in again. Okay. There we go. And then if you just put that back into presentation, that hopefully should. To start, can you see now? Um, we can see the whole PowerPoint, but still, that you need to move down to slide number two and beyond. Okay. Highlighted on your first slide. Okay. So, can, if you can do me a favour, can you tell me what slide you can see now? We, we can see all your screen. We can see the whole of the PowerPoint, the menu, and everything. And <laughs> we can still see your height. I can see on the left hand toolbar that the first slide is highlighted. You need to kind of highlight the ones below that. Yeah, and it's not moved, has it? Tell you what, David, sure. if you don't mind, I've got your slideshow, so I'll share it on our side. So if you don't mind, just asking me to click through it, that's okay. That's fine. fine. Give me two seconds, sorry. Sorry about that. If you wait a second, then Ruth will bring up your um, presentation. Um, ah, and um, just to know where you want her to be. Uh, uh, that's great. Oh, fantastic. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Okay, so um, I'll just step back a little bit. So we, we uh, looked through the regulations and there was 15 references to cost effective, but nothing that was, uh, I could find a definition for that. So I did look at the impact assessment and you can see there in the table, 
that the impact assessment for future homes and for future buildings both have a, a net benefit based on option two. Option one, interestingly, had a lesser benefit uh, or no benefit and was less ambitious in terms of saving carbon. So uh, it strikes me that we can, can afford to do more to achieve um, a, perhaps even a smaller benefit by having a bit more cost. However, if we look at the next slide, um, I thought I'd also dip back into look at the Code for Sustainable Homes because we find ourselves in a similar position. Um, when the Code for Sustainable Homes first came out, and there was quite a furore about the cost. Uh, and you can see there, back in August 2021, DCLG put out a cost update on Code for Sustainable Homes. And level five homes were in the region of uh, an anticipated extra over cost of 20 to 25K per dwelling. Yet four years later, and uh, the zero carbon hub, albeit level five and carbon compliance aren't quite aligned, was given us a figure of approximately five thousand pounds for an extra over cost. So it's uh, it's self evident that if the market has a target to reach, it will innovate and it will reduce cost. And the same has happened with PV panels, uh, and the same has happened with LED lighting. Uh, and that LED lighting is also acknowledged in the um, Part L 2021. We can look at the next slide so what's what's evident through the through the process that we've been through is we can demonstrate that there is a significant afford uh, there's a big benefit um, and that there is every likelihood that the anticipated costs will reduce however is it just really about affordability well as has already been mentioned we have um, an absolute target to achieve uh, which is um, our net zero carbon uh, and those figures of 35 for residential or 55 for uh, commercial. So in many respects, it's not really about um, a cost being cost effective. It's really about achieving an absolute target on the basis that that, that absolute target is the correct target to go for. Um, and as has already been mentioned, um, the targets for and the EUI are based on renewable energy generation or projected renewable energy generation. And I think it would be very useful if that, the detail behind that calculation was made available and we could see if there was any likelihood of those EUIs um, increasing um, if we generated more renewable energy, because I suspect that that would be more cost effective than trying to uh, continue to create uh, energy, energy performance improvements on individual dwellings. However, who really pays for net zero carbon? Because um, if we don't build homes to a net zero carbon standard now, then at the end of the day, it's going to have to be retrofitted and that cost will sit with the building owner or the homeowner, which is you or I. And as is clear, when we look at things like the Green Homes Grant, um, building owners and homeowners aren't in a position to, to afford or, or not going to individually uh, improve their homes to a net zero carbon standard. So the government ends up paying or subsidising albeit one hopes they come up with a better solution than the uh, recent uh, Green Homes Grants. And it's recognised that retrofit is many times more expensive. So on the basis that we can, uh, the costs are likely to go down based on, based on what we've seen with coal for sustainable homes, that the benefits are already um, significant to the UK. If we could do a bit more, what would we do? So if we look at the next slide, um, we can see that um, 2050, we've got 29 years to 2050, um, and there will be an MEP refresh in most buildings between now and then. However, the building envelope is going to last for 60 to 100 years. So if we were going to do a little bit more, we should be looking at the building envelope. Uh, and the chart you can see in front of you, I've taken from a Korean Brown report, which they did for the Climate Change Committee on the costs and benefits for tighter standards. And if we look at the uh, two columns on the right hand side, the very last column is approximately showing an approximately 25% improvement in terms of a retrofit. And the green and the blue lumps are lumps associated with fabric and glazing. So we can see that the most significant costs to retrofit are the actual fabric. So once again, it would seem likely that we should be looking at the um, fabric elements uh, to upgrade now in advance of any further changes in 2025. And the key finding of that report makes it relatively clear that higher standards now versus retrofit 
are five to 10 times more expensive as a retrofit. So if we look at the next slide, please. Let's have a look at the fabric standards that we have suggested in Part L 2021, and that's in the uh, first column, uh, which is clear. If we compare um, the proposed fabric standards to the old Code for Sustainable Homes Level 5 and 6, which is what we were going to achieve six years ago, we can see that the Code for Sustainable Homes Level 5, the yellow areas, highlight where they, those standards exceed the proposals that we have on the table at the moment. If we then compare them to the letter requirements, we can see in green where they uh, exceed the standards currently proposed and where they, the, the two um, unhighlighted areas are really where they're broadly speaking the same. And perhaps the most important difference between the letter requirements and the current standards is that issue of um, permeability. Achieving less than one a passive house standard um, is certainly something that we should be thinking about now in terms of developing the skill sets to do that. And interestingly enough, if we look at the last column, this was a slightly murky orange, um, highlights where the current part L is suggesting that retrofit standards for existing buildings can be less than new build, which I have to say I haven't seen on previous versions. It's usually been the same standard. And if we look at the next slide, we can see that that arrangement is just the same for, for future buildings, um, except that in all cases, if we compare the proposed standards to the letter requirements for the fabric, all of the letter requirements are significantly lower than the proposed standards um, today. So we have a look at the, the last slide. Um, what can we see? We can see that the benefits exceed the costs by some margin. Uh, we know the market will innovate and the costs will come down. At the end of the day, we have a series of absolute targets, not, not relative ones. And that retrofit is five to 10 times more expensive compared to new builds. So self-evident that we should be doing more now. And that, as a minimum, should be improving the fabric elements um, of the standards in RDL 2021. Thank you. Great. Well, th thanks very much, um, David. Um, so I've got, got one question, really, in terms of the, um, the the costs and the benefits, which your presentation is, you know, makes absolute sense. But is the challenge um, the fact that these costs and benefits aren't sort of necessarily um, reaped by one sort of in company or individual? So, for example, you, you build a home to higher standards, but then the, the house builder doesn't reap the benefits if they can't sell it at a cost premium and the same again yeah. I mean how can you reconcile that so we can actually have an honest whole life cost uh, that's a very good question because having, having I do speak to um, people who are uh, a bit squashed in the middle in terms of people with land people trying to build and homeowners um, I think it's one of those things that will we'll find its way it'll have to wash out in time because at the moment it's true if the, the costs sit with the with the uh, contractor that's bound to influence the cost on, of the land and if we don't get that mix right people will tend not to develop uh, particularly if they can't pass on that cost to the to the person who's going to purchase the house i think there is a, a case where we need to push those standards and accept that there will be some short-term pain before we can pass that on to the to the homeowners but it will have to be reflected in in some way or other in the purchase price of the home. If we go back and look at the impact assessment with the current proposals, the suggestion is there is no impact um, on the um, home purchaser, but there may be some impact um, on the uh, cost of the land. So I, I completely accept that while the benefits for the UK are large, it does penalise uh, in the near term uh, people in the middle of that equation. Great, well, thank you. Um, so if I can um, finish the formal presentations now, so if I could ask everyone else to put on their webcams, because we're, we're now going to move into the, um, the sort of discuss the issues that are being raised, uh, and also take questions from our audience as well. Um, um, so I, I think the first question, I've, one really for me is that, I mean, I think everyone here who's presented is calling for higher standards we talked about passive house uh amongst many other things the, the question is is the you know if, if these 
future homes and building standards were much tougher and they introduced them, I don't know, let's say in 2023. Could the industry actually cope with it? Is the industry actually up to the job of building these buildings which are going to be a, a much higher performing than what they're building now? Anyone like to? Okay, no, sorry, I wasn't sure if you were going to start. Um, I think um, just sort of reflecting on that cost issue as well is, is is that if we focus on the on on the fabric, um, then the, there's an ability to sort of split that split the difference, if you like, between in terms of costs. But going going back to fabric and the question you asked, we were designing to higher standards for code for sustainable homes back in 2014. Uh, and, and, the, and the market was geared up for that, it was going to deliver it, and it was only because the government pulled the plug that it did happen. So um, I would certainly say there's, that there's no reason why those standards cannot be built. Now, there's a separate question about capacity in the market and whether we've got the skill sets and all of those, uh, um, of the quantity of skill set. But in certain, certainly in terms of delivering higher standards of, of fabric performance, I, I, I don't see why there's any issue with, 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 being, not, with, with being able to do that. Okay. If I could add, like, th there is an issue of capacity. The skills are there, mm -hmm. but not everybody has them. Um, I, I would say, though, that there's a huge learning curve to go through in terms of what is the right balance. And you, the, the, the performance of the fabric is dependent on what's happening in the space itself. So a space that has high internal loads doesn't necessarily need as high a fabric standard in terms of keeping the heat in because it's trying to lose heat a lot of the time. Uh, a space that's largely empty does need higher fabric standards. And it's all about visibility as well because Part L hasn't dealt with thermal bridging properties, so we didn't couldn't even see the fact that the envelope wasn't performing properly. And the other thing I'd say is there's a, a trade-off, and I, I've mentioned this earlier, between systems and fabric. And to my mind, there's a logic to saying if you look at how efficiently your heat is generated, and if it is very efficient, then your fabric can be relaxed, which means then you can start optimizing where you spend your money. And this is just as important because if you say we've got um, increasing temperatures that we have to deal with, that also applies to winter time. So building buildings now to the absolutely highest standard in terms of envelopes, could well be counterproductive in 15, 20 years time. It, it doesn't need a high standard, but it doesn't necessarily need the highest standard. And if you have a, a lower standard, you've saved costs, you've, you've invested in your systems rather than the envelope, then in 15 years time, you probably need a lesser system. And you've, you've, you've used your, your capital budget in the best possible way. That, that's, my, that's my take on it. Yeah, inter so interesting. That, that's why you need to consider the whole life implications. Because if you're renewing your services every 10, 15 years or whatever, then that has to be factored in, doesn't it? Whereas, as David said, if you're investing in decent performance of fabric, you know, that's going to last, last, last a lifetime or a building lifetime, as we currently <laughs> count it. You're absolutely right, Lynn. And the other thing is that, you know, we need to consider embodied carbon too. So if you say we're going to go triple glazing, then if you're in 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 the north of Scotland or England, where the, it's much colder, then you're you've got a greater operational saving than in the south. But you've got a greater yeah. embodied content as well, and sometimes the embodied content will uh, be higher than the operational energy that it would save. So again, it becomes a very complex. I, I agree, but but that, that issue of the economies of scale, I mean, it's a bit like we all started off with black and white cameras, <laughs> you know, and now it's much more expensive to get a black and white print than it is a colour one. So, it, it, you know, it, it, experience shows that if we have a we create a mass market, then costs will come down. So I, I would argue we need to invest and, you know, the UK could invest in more production. That's that's the way we should go once we've identified some really decent standards. Um, an interesting um, point from um, Anthony Caravan on our um, question. So he said that Exeter City Council is building passive house homes for less than 5% additional cost, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they've got good designers and, and experienced contractors. 
Um, yeah. And I guess that the council are funding that, and it's you know for social housing that's great because it will help with um, residents' fuel bills, and they can sort of take the whole life view. But if that, those were private homes, but that five percent mean what would the impact? What impact would that really have on the house builders and also the people buying their homes? It was five percent more. Well, extra are also building housing for the market, and they're tracking very closely what premium they can attract given they've got a very good track record with their social housing on, on passive house. So they are attracting a premium, a modest one. But, you know, it's that question of uh, confidence, isn't it, in the market? If not only the surveyors, but also consumers understand that a certain standard means they're actually going to get heating bills of, you know, uh, £100 a year, then, then you know, then, then, then the market will reflect that. And that's interesting then. I mean, are they advertising? I mean, are these private for sale homes, passive houses as well? They've got market sale houses as well. Yeah, because right. I, I are they, I'm, are I'm they advertising them. passive houses? Is it like a sort of you know marketing thing really and which can come out on that premium? Yeah, it's just you know, people don't believe in it enough yet to, that it's a general thing that our ICS accept, for example, valuations that you know. But but other other associations have used it. So people like Hasco. Housing Association, who are also a passive house pioneer, they have, have uh, a market sale uh, premium uh, for, for more energy efficient homes. So uh, I, I think there's definitely suggestions that the, the consumer is interested in, in this, but we really need to have it at mass scale to be able to make it affordable across sectors. Mm -hmm. I suspect in the short term as well that it will impact a little bit on, on land values because the, the um, housing developers in particular will be quite sharp to that and, and there may be something because they can see the impact on them and that will affect on the land value. They can't yet perhaps see the premium for the house will sell for in the market or the building will sell for in the market. But it will it will wash it will wash through. And and I would just pick up on Alan's point, it's absolutely true when you've got large deep plan offices and you've got lots of um, cooling loads. Um, then you don't necessarily need the level of performance that, um, that we've talk, spoken about in, in certain cases, but for housing, it's slightly different. Okay, um, I've got an, an interesting question here um, from, um, bear with me, Jonathan Ducker. You probably will remember, I think it was 2006, Pyle, there was going to be something called consequential improvements introduced for yeah. dwelling. Um, yeah. By if you build a, a um, extension, you have to upgrade the energy efficiency of the whole home. I think Daily Mail dubbed this the conservatory tax, and the Labour government dumped it on the grounds it wasn't going to be very popular electorally, which I think raises all sorts of interesting issues in terms of introducing higher standards. John, John is asking, should we be bringing this back for homes, and how will you make it work? Palatable this time. Just say a couple of things. I mean, the consequential improvements were, I think, um, I'll choose my words carefully. I, I'm not sure if it actually did make a, a big change. I know people spent some time trying to avoid it uh, and avoid touching things so they didn't have to make those consequential improvements. Um, but it does raise a, another point in that while well, we are talking about new building contextually, but um, we have a huge, huge other issue associated with retrofitting all of our existing buildings. And uh, it's a much bigger issue, actually, I think, than, than, than new build and funding that and finding funding mechanisms to make that work. So you and I you know, are comfortable to have our homes upgraded to, to, net, to net zero carbon or close. Um, it is, it, to me, is a much, much bigger issue than uh, some of the components we're talking about uh, uh, today. I guess the consequential improvements is a way of sort of helping to nudge that along, really. Um, we can say consequential improvements um, didn't do anything. Uh, on, on almost any given project, you could identify some activity that would have been done anyway as being the additional 10%. And equally, it was subject to a um, a financial viability as well as technical. Yeah. Yeah. And but the point about the calculations, particularly with the non-domestic, is that they grossly underestimated anything to do with heat energy. And as a result, then you could always discard almost anything on the basis that it wasn't financially viable. Right, right. 
We'll have to have another webinar on retrofit, Thomas. Yeah, well, I think we will. <laughs> we will. I'm it's sure a, you've got one or two lined up. Whole it's a whole topic on its own, really. Um, probably not one for today, really, in terms of um, looking at this um, um, future building standards. Um, I mean, um, I think, Thomas, I, what I think is really interesting is the, um, uh, I think Alan gave the example of the Better Buildings Partnership who are, who are using this neighbours mechanism. And then David referenced the Bay's uh, performance, whatever it is, framework. Um, you know, it's actually investors that are driving that. They want buildings that, you know, do what they say on the tin and, and that are proven to, to be res both resilient and comfortable. So I, I think, you know, in, if, if commercial building, big commercial investors start going that way, it does really beg the question, you know, whether homes should, should be moving in that same direction as well. I mean, you raise an interesting um, um, point there, Lynn, with, with neighbours and the, that whole idea of a certification of um, and building performance. And you're absolutely right. I mean, all the leading developers are well ahead of all these standards already because ah. investor, investor pressure. But what happens when you go further down, if you like, the chain to the small regional developers in, I don't know, I don't pick on places, but places like Exeter, um, where maybe there isn't that awareness? I mean, do you, do you think that um, neighbours could help sort of improve those um, buildings and put sort of pressure on those sort of developers, or does it need more than that? Well, I, I think it's it, it's it's much wider than this because we're, we're we're thinking about this in terms of commercial, and um, but in reality, schools for many years now have had similar standards in terms of performance and use. It just hasn't been particularly well enforced, and that 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 is changing, and that brings it to a scale which is a much smaller type builder contractor which means it also will filter through into the residential. And I would also say that um, all the kind of government departments, all their construction projects are focused on um, on net zero. And like MOD, for example, is building a lot of residential, which are basically this exactly the same as student accommodation type blocks. They're, they're very much residential scale. And that then is getting builders at that scale to adopt these standards as well. So it, it is, it is shifting. It is it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're absolutely right. You, uh, when I was pondering um, my presentation, you think to yourself, well, actually, the standards are being exceeded by by lots of parts of the, or at least trying to exceed them in lots of parts of industry. There's a big push down by funders. Funders are asking for net zero carbon buildings, and that's infecting, uh, influencing investors, and that's washing down perhaps into the into the more lucrative parts of the market, but it will come, it will come through homes as well. Um, and you think to yourself in, in, in the fullness of time, that kind of stranded asset argument that's been put in the investor community must wash through into homes. Now, if you haven't got... It's an asset, isn't it? Yeah, if you, if you haven't got a home that's net zero carbon, somebody's going to come along and say, well, it'll cost me £20,000 to upgrade that, so I'll take it off the price in the fullness of time. Now, it's not there yet. But you, you do realise that that part L and its um, in, impact is perhaps not in that part of the market. It's that wash through to other parts of the of the UK that perhaps where development costs, um, sorry, where the cost, the benefit of development isn't the same and it's of a lesser standard. And it's those parts of the market I think that we're, we really need to capture to to be able to get it to wash through the rest of the UK. Right. Hey. Well, um, believe it or not, our hour is pretty well up now, so we're going to have to leave it there for today. Um, so I'd just like to thank our panellists um, for a very interesting discussion. This one is clearly going to run and run. And um, I'd like to advise our audience that the, um, th th this webinar will be available for download. And also, please do come back tomorrow for, um, we have two more webinars on, on, on the whole topic of net zero. So. Thanks to our panelists again and thanks to everybody for listening. Thank, Thank you. you.